right. Hey, it is great to see you all here on this Labor Day weekend. I know some of our connect groups aren't meeting today, but I know too that there are some who are first time guests with us because I've met you. I'm so glad you're here. There may be others in the, in the chapel who are watching us. Some of you who are new may not know that um, we're doing a refresh on our sanctuary, which is why we're kind of moving around and these days are a little, little different, but everybody's doing their part. As, uh, as we seek to, to serve the Lord and do what is necessary. But uh, today, we are wrapping up a series that you may or may not know we've been doing throughout really the, the month of August. And uh, we, we started by saying that every person is created in the image of God. We're going to wrap up today, kind of put a bow on it to say every person then, uh, an extension of that, is gifted to serve the Lord in a very unique way. We're going to talk about that. And there's no one better uh, to come and talk to us about this than uh, Kimberly Cook, our own Kim Cook. I'll introduce her in just a moment. Um, So we just kicked off uh, football season, right? Pun intended. And the team that is going to win the national championship is, is, or, or the Super Bowl is... The best, probably the best team that has the players in the right spots, in those roles, who do their best so that the best team will win. Okay, I know. You can have your favorites and all the things. But if Paul had, uh, had, if they'd been playing football in the first century, um, he might have been instructing the church in Corinth uh, with that kind of an apt analogy. The, The very best team, you know, that serves uh, their purposes in their roles, they're probably gonna, gonna flourish. They're probably gonna win the game. And so today we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can go and turn there, 1 Corinthians 12, and we're gonna get a passage of scripture that's gonna help us understand uh, how we are all gifted, particularly focused in on uh, giftings within the church. But uh, what Paul's gonna teach us here, again, if he, if he had the analogy of football, he could say, you know, you're, you don't want... A, uh, a kicker, for instance, saying, hey, you know, I'd like to play offensive guard, you know, is what I want to do. And then the quarterback not make it out of the first play from scrimmage, you know, after that. Or for a guard or a big giant tackle to say, I want to play wide receiver. He's likely not going to go long and he's not going to get open, right? And so, so what Paul is going to teach us here, and it's so important that every person created in the image of God has particular gifts that are to be brought to bear on the building up of the kingdom of God. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, how that specifically works in the church, but also how every person on the planet is gifted to serve the Lord in some form, some way. And so I want us to dive into this passage and we're going to look at it. And then as we've been doing each week, we're going to have a conversation around this, seeking to apply it. And then we're going to continue on uh, this coming Wednesday night from six to seven. We've been having incredible times where we have continued the conversation and we're going to do that to take a deeper dive. We can only cover so much today, but we're going to talk about how each person is uniquely gifted Uh, for God's purpose. That's what we're going to really focus on today. And this passage is going to help us see the diversity of gifts, the the demonstration, the manifestation of gifts, and then the distribution of gifts. How God is the one who does all of this. And all of it we could land on is the, I could say the direction or the, the reason for the gifts, for the building up of the body. Keep that in mind. That's the end game when it comes to spiritual gifts in the church, okay? So first, let's talk about the diversity of gifts. Look at verse, verses four through six. Paul, by the way, in context, he's been talking about how the spirit, he keeps talking about the spirit of God, has brought all of us together. We're here because we have been transformed by the power of God, rescued from our sin because of Christ and his grace extended to us, his work completed on the cross. We have received his grace. Those of us who are now now disciples of Jesus. And Paul's been saying the spirit is at work in the body. That's what makes this gathering very different uh, than simply maybe going to work or some other place. We come together. He's been talking about the spirit of God present in the church. Okay. Now keep that in mind. And then he says, there are different kinds of gifts. Okay. Check out his language here, almost a parallelism, but the same spirit distributes them. 
There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So you see that? Gifts, service, working, okay, all different, he says, different kinds, but they're all from the same, same Lord, the same spirit, same God. Uh, so God is the source, but we all have different gifts, all right, is the foundational thought here. Now, where we get confused oftentimes in a, in a church, or this can happen anywhere, I guess, in culture, is uh, a lot of times in the, we, want, we want everybody united, okay, which is what he's talking about, unity in the body, but there's diversity. In fact, I could argue you don't have unity apart from diversity, You have uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. Uniformity is everybody looking the same, acting the same, same, you know, same background, same, everybody believing exactly the same thing. Uh, And and in a church where there's unity in diversity, it's where we all come from different backgrounds, different ages, we have different gifts and all the things. And we even may have different preferences or even different convictions outside of core beliefs. And, and, and we're okay with that because we're all moving in the same direction, which is ultimately to lead all generations to love Jesus. It's to make disciples. And so we are a church that is, is focused and committed to unity within diversity. And that's what Paul is saying. Let's be this kind of church. The beauty of being uh, the pastor, there's a lot of great uh, things about my role. Um, And one of those things is that every week, as we did this past week, on Mondays, we gather together with ministers and we pray. We pray for you. We pray for our church family. We celebrate. We put Christ in the center of the circle and we celebrate what he's doing in our lives. This past week, we had an all uh, all staff, okay, gathering, where we heard from different ones. We were really celebrating what God has done throughout the summer uh, when it came to, you know, youth camp or way back to VVS or mission trips and all that he has done. We just celebrated and praised the Lord for how you, our church family, has been serving with all your diverse gifts. We had over 1,500 kids who were involved in our summer camps and all of the work that's going on in our church and so many more even mission trips and opportunities that we have, our back to school blast for our Jack Lowe friends, all of this to say, this is the kind of church that God is shaping and forming here. And it is amazing what he is doing through your giftedness. The big question, I guess, today is, you know, what is your ministry or where are you serving? If we want to get real practical, that's our hope today is that we are all understanding. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm clay in the potter's hand is what uh, the the scripture says. We are canvas where he does his masterpiece, his work through our lives and together so much more beautiful with the varied colors and textures uh, of a masterpiece. That is the church. That's why N.T. Wright says that the church is a working model of new creation. That's what it is. People see us in community, loving each other and serving each other and then outside of ourselves. And that is the beauty of the church. So we see first this diversity, okay? Um, Now look at this. We see also the demonstration of gifts. This is verse seven. How are these gifts on display? He says, now to each one, okay, the diverse gifts, the manifestation or the demonstration of the spirit is given for the common Good, okay? So there's singular gifting, common blessing in the body. Every person who's doing their thing, blessing others. One of the things I do um, weekly, did it again this week, writing notes to people who've joined our church to welcome them into our church family. And and I I will often note, um, hey, we are now a better church because you are now here as a member. Because, listen to this, something was not happening before you got here and it's about to happen because God has gifted you to serve. And this could be a convicting word for some of us who are like, well, I'm not sure what I bring to the table. We're gonna talk about that a bit. It's always for the building up of of the body, right? And so as as we look at the diversity of gifts, we know that each of us are unique, created uniquely for the building up of the kingdom of God and, and we celebrate every person 
and we're better because you are here. You're here for, per- for a purpose. God's sovereign hand has brought you here. Let me ask you this, and this is uh, a challenge even for this morning, a posture coming in to, uh, to worship. Anytime we gather into your connect group, maybe it's a ministry opportunity, a mission effort. Every time we come together, maybe it's a small group in a home this week. What if every time you entered into the body of Christ, you came in not to be served, though there are times we are served, but you came to serve. What if your posture every time was when I show up, I'm looking for people that I can bless today? Because really, this is the cruciform life, isn't it? This is the Christian life, is the life of a disciple. Now outside of ourselves serving others. But how different would your posture be if you came into worship to say, I'm going to worship God, and the way I worship him, I, I, I love him by loving others. So whomever I encounter today, I'm going to serve. What if church really was for you a place where uh, you go in order to serve, not simply to receive? You would move from, how about this, a consumer, which often then becomes a critic, to someone who is a kingdom uh, contributor. That would be a very different posture. And I think... Those who come to church that way, come into the body of Christ that way in order to bless others, they are the most joyful people among us. They're the ones living the good life that we're going to start talking about this next week as we enter into this whole series on the Sermon on the Mount throughout the fall. But when you move from that posture, you're now living in the way of Jesus You're experiencing the diversity of gifts, celebrating others. You're experiencing this demonstration of his gifts that he's given you to bless others. That's the purpose, right? That he's he's given you certain gifts. And then finally, I want you to see the distribution of gifts. Okay, so it goes now to this place where it's God who does all this. But this is where I think we struggle maybe the most and why we're going to land here and talk more about this. Look at verse 8. He says, to to one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit. Now, this is not a comprehensive list, by the way. And there's also Romans 12. Uh, Paul jumps in even later in in Corinthians. He talks about other gifts as well. But he goes into uh, gifts of healing uh, for for, uh, miraculous powers, to another prophecy, um, that is, is speaking truth to, to another, the distinguishing of, of spirits, this discernment, a power of discernment and wisdom and understanding. He gets into speaking of different, different tongues and interpretation of tongues. We don't have time to get into that. But all these are the work of one. Here's his point in all this. One and the same spirit. He distributes, there's the word, them to each one just as he determines. Okay, so God's the one who determines gifts. Now, that's easy for us, I suppose, to say, yeah, I get that, I get that, but I sure wish I had that gift. I'm gonna have that gift that that person has. And sometimes that can get us into trouble because we think, I would like to have that gift, seems to be more important than another gift, and then we start to get out of whack, maybe ending up in places we don't belong. We're gonna talk about that a little bit today. So God's role is to distribute the gifts. Our role is to receive those gifts and praise him for it and to live in our gifting. So we can never feel envious or feel inferior about another person's gifts. And, and we are the ones who then say, Lord, I'm just here to serve. This past week, uh, we, we celebrated our properties and service staff and our security staff. Um, those who serve behind the scenes, many that you don't see. But you all know we could not do what we do without our, th- those people on our staff. So we gathered them together. We had lunch together to honor them. And, uh, and one of the things then uh, we did afterwards, I spoke uh, out of John 13. And I told them that, you know, we see Jesus showing us who the most powerful man in the room is in the kingdom uh, in John 13, where he gets his disciples together and it's right before he's then the next day he's going to be, well, he's going to be arrested, go to the cross. Uh, and he gets down on his knees. You probably know the story. And he washes the disciples' feet. So we, we could argue that no gift is greater than another, but Jesus seems to teach us that those who serve, and how about this, those who serve in obscurity, those who serve uh, unseen, those who serve in places 
that maybe others don't want to serve. You could argue that in the kingdom, maybe they are a bit greater. So I was just noting with our properties and service staff, even our security team, you guys are among the greatest among us in this upside down kingdom, again, that we'll talk much about in the days to come. So brothers and sisters, those of you who serve unseen, many of you who will be serving our preschoolers, changing diapers today, those who are serving, just holding doors, serving in our, uh, uh, gosh, parking ministry, uh, our deacons who are serving, those of you who are serving our our in-home members, making a phone call, all of those things going unseen in obscurity, the Lord sees you, you are among the greatest in the kingdom. Of course, the problem in the church so often is uh, what we'll see this football season. We've talked about this before, but we saw it last night. If you're watching games, we'll see it upcoming. You have 22 men on the field in desperate need of rest and thousands of people, maybe millions on television watching in desperate need of exercise. (laughs) And it can happen in the church. You know, you've, all, you've probably heard about the 80-20 rule or whatever. Uh, um, surely it happens in the church. So the big question comes, you know, we, wanna, we all want to have this flourishing, wonderful church. It, it will be that when every person is serving in their place of giftness and you will experience the great joy of serving the Lord. And again, all of this is the, for the building up of the body of Christ. So again, we couldn't think of anyone who would be better to come and talk to us about this than, than Kim Cook. You might say, well, why Kim? So Kimberly Cook is married to Travis. Many of you know Travis Cook, our teaching pastor. He serves, uh, leads our residency program, our prayer ministry, he does lots of things around here. But, um, but we all think that like Travis just seems to be brilliant, but actually, actually Kim is the one who's really brilliant. Um, but they have, they have Hattie and Sophie. Hattie's eight and Sophie is five. They're two of my favorite, cutest little girls ever. She is the assistant director at the Hendricks Center at DTS. She's actually finished her uh, doctoral research and such and dissertation um, on the topic of giftedness. She helps lead um, uh, a giftedness, a discovery a kind of giftedness thing. She's actually done it here several times where you take a deep dive into how you can figure out what your gifting is. And we're gonna have one, watch for it, we'll be announcing. Um, we're gonna do one here. She's been gracious enough to say, again, I'll, yes, I'd love to do that, serve our church family. So, so watch for that. That's probably one big application that will come from this. But let's do this. Um, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Kimberly Cook as she comes here to, to bless us. Kim, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much of for course. coming and being Glad with us. Glad to be here. So tell us more. I'm so intrigued and we have just limited time here, but tell us more about your, your doctoral work and the dissertation that you have completed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting to defend my dissertation. That's why we can't. I'm going to go ahead and call you doctor. Words. So Dr. <laughs> Cook, go ahead. So I was working at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary, which is DTS's leadership center. And we were beginning these giftedness discovery workshops. And I was struck by how meaningful the process was. And, and in the midst of all of it, you know, because it's a bunch of seminarians and people sitting around <laughs> talking, there, are a lot of, there were a lot of theological claims being thrown around about who God is and who we are in the midst of all of this giftedness. And it became apparent that nobody had actually done the biblical and theological work to lay a foundation for all of that. And so that's where I stepped in and said, well, I was kind of thinking about doing a PhD anyway, so why don't I study this? <laughs> and, uh, and so I kind of came to the conclusion that after <laughs> lots, of, so much reading, guys, so much, um, that we're all made uniquely, in, er, we're all made in the image of God, which we all hopefully affirm, but not only that, we make a positive contribution to God's creation. Every single human being does in mm. a unique way. So I know you have a real passion for this. Um, yeah, the fact we started this series, again, talking about every person is created in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Like you can't, you don't choose that. And in the same way, every person is gifted by God. Mm-hmm. And you don't choose that either. It's his sovereign grace, his sovereign work in our lives. You have a real passion that every person on the planet Mm -hmm. is gifted by God and is serving his purpose, really. Mm -hmm. 
So what's the, and that's a bigger, longer conversation. We can talk about it Wednesday night a bit more, but what then is the distinction between spiritual gifts in the body, okay, and then what we're saying, every person on the planet is gifted in some way to serve the Lord. Yeah, so what we were just talking about in 1 Corinthians 12, and there are two or three other passages in scripture, those are really biblical uh, spiritual gifts for, like Jeff was saying, for the empowerment of the body. So that is gifts given to believers for the purpose of the church and making disciples and everything the church is supposed to do. The giftedness I'm talking about is still in the terrain, is still in the uh, divine empowerment conversation. It's just divine empowerment um, gifts that God gives every single human being for the purpose of, and because he's just decided to do it this way, for the purpose of uh, providing for his creation, blessing his creation, protecting his creation. He has chosen to do that through us. And he also shows us how big of a God he is. Because if you think mm. of the fact that every single one of us uniquely image him, think about how big he is if every person does that throughout history. So what is He's my amazing. then, what's Christian response, if you will, to that, that idea? Well, I'm, for that, me, it's worship. <laughs> yeah, just. I'm thinking, oh, wow, God, how you're big God so is. so massive, yeah. yes. And, and I never fully appreciated that. But the second response then, as a believer, would also say, oh my goodness, I have to be so careful with every single person that I encounter because they deserve massive amounts of respect because they are a unique image of God, mm. a unique bearer that nobody else will ever have the opportunity to encounter, yeah. apart from you know, people who interact with them. And even in conversations, this can happen at work, uh, in your family, to call that out of mm -hmm. them, right? To Absolutely. like, you may not know this, but I see this in to you. And I'm, that. I'm mm -hmm. a Christian and I see it. I just want to name it, you know? And even a step further, typically the things that make us distinct or unique are actually the things that we're often shamed for or made fun of for. Mm. And so it is not very often that people get called out in a positive way and affirmed for what it is that makes them distinct. Wow. That's good. So you're blessing someone and, and they're going, hmm, I've never thought about it that way. Maybe. Exactly. So um, how, here's what everybody's thinking. We think about spiritual gifts. It's always, how can I find my spiritual gift? And there's a lot of questions that we can talk about, some here, but Wednesday night as well. Um, wow, I got to make sure I'm, I'm serving the Lord in my place or I'm going to ruin my life, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then others who... As a pastor, I've seen the struggle where we find ourselves in places where maybe that's not really your gifting. But how, talk to us about that. How do you, how do you find your place where God's, how he's created you? Yeah, serve? so some people are really scared that there is this holy grail of a role <laughs> or mm. spot out there that they have to land in or they're going to miss God's purpose for their life. And the reality of us being made in his image uniquely and positively contributing to his creation is that it's baked into who you are. You are already uniquely going about things how you are. And so, and God knows that, and he's put you in the place that he's put you. And so you don't really have to worry about landing in the right place <laughs> because he is guiding that. Now, there is a place for learning a bit more about the types, like, how you go about being who you are and there's some intentionality that we can put behind that and that's mm. where the giftedness process comes in. But you don't, you don't actually have to stress that you're gonna miss God's purpose for you because it is, you're acting out of that unique place every single day and so you don't have to worry so about it as much. That's, that can be real freeing. Hopefully. <laughs> um, so as Christ followers, we're disciples, right? We're following after Jesus, doing what he did. Um, if we're doing that, you're saying the twist for me then is instead of hyper-focused on, am I in the right place? Am I, should I be serving here? Should I be doing this? Should I be serving this? Is as, as you go, mm -hmm. is what Jesus said, as you're going, make disciples, right? So what about the person, uh, two things I see. One is a person that might be serving in a unique place and saying, this is my role. This is what I do. 
Uh, we see this like with the gift of evangelism, for instance. Well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so I'll just leave that for others. You know, it's like, well, no, no, we're all called to share the gospel with others. What do you say about that? So there's one thing. The other is when we find people who are serving in places, uh, it's almost like the American Idol syndrome thing. It's like you, you can't sing. Like, somebody <laughs> should have told you, like, you can't sing. And yet we find ourselves in roles. I'm sure I've been in roles where I'm like, that doesn't fit me well. Or maybe mm -hmm. I, I feel more anxiety when I'm over here out of my giftedness. Um, I'm not joyful. Or, so how do you, those are two questions probably. How do we, how do we clarify some of that? But for, so for both of those situations and a variety of other ones, that's why I really do encourage everybody to go through some kind of process like this to identify who it is and what beautiful dimensions of God's image you have been created um, in and who you are, who he has created you to be, not who you're afraid that you are, not who you want to be, mm. not who you think you should be, but who is it that God has created you to be? And the really difficult thing here is that because we're all so unique, we think we're going about life in the way that everybody else does. I get up, I use these certain abilities, I use these certain kinds of tools, I'm in these general kinds of environments just like every other human being. And the reality is no, not everybody does it that way. In fact, nobody probably does it exactly like you do. And so we really need a, like a second person or a third party to come in and help us like get outside of ourselves and then kind of turn us around and point out what is actually distinct and unique about us. Don't, so um, I think most of us, like I probably would have thought this, I think I'm pretty self-aware. You know, mm -hmm. I think I'm, and the older we get, I think it's like, oh, I know what I do, don't do. I'm pretty humble, I think. I, I think I can figure this out. And, and I'm doing it in community. Uh, um, what, what, what would you say to that? You, you all have worked with thousands of students who are trying to figure out what is my thing. People end up in seminary. Gosh, people end up in ministry, sorry, that maybe don't belong in ministry mm -hmm. or, or in the local church. They belong in something else. Um, how, what do you say about that? that oh, well, people are, most people are pretty self-aware. They can figure it out on their own. Yeah, it's actually so rare. <laughs> Have you it's ever met so, someone who's actually that self-aware? I have not ever. I, I have met many people who, at the end of the giftedness process, right, would say, right. yeah, I think I kind of, I knew that generally about myself, but there's almost always a, a key or like a linchpin that, some, that kind of falls into place for someone. And they never, it always takes another person or several people to mm -hmm. kind of help you really understand what it is. Because... You've, it, you've lived your own life and you just, it's really hard to step out yeah. of that in a helpful way. That's a really big, um, I think, truth we need to grasp is we, yes, we do it in community, but very few of us are really that aware, which is why we have each other, right? And people we to We have to humble us. ourselves yeah. with other people. Mm -hmm. Which is hard for us to do, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so how can we be more gracious to ourselves when it comes to our gifting? So when we are aware of certain patterns and certain ways we go about our life and how it is that we do things, when we, when we have that, uh, finally, that language and understanding of ourselves, God's grace really can flow in um, to help us with successes and with our failures. So success here, I am not talking about prosperity, health, and wealth, like everything's going to be great and I'm on the front of the mm -hmm. book kind of thing. Um, what I'm talking about success here is as like a, a deep sense of peace, the shalom in the Bible that we see, a sense of satisfaction or philosophy is the good life. Mm -hmm. So God's grace allows us to go into a place of success a bit more with give, it, when we're aware of these patterns because we see how we fit. So there are certain requirements in life and for any role that we have and then we have who we actually have been created to be. And the more those two overlap, the better the fit and the more likely we're gonna be in a place of satisfaction. Um, so God's grace can bring us into a place of greater success, but it can also help us better understand some failures. Now, I'm not talking about trauma or sin here, mm. but just things that you've tried or you know, projects that you worked on and something failed. 
and you failed big, and it left a really bad taste in your mouth, and you don't even really like to think about it. We all, I think, have some things like that, and when we have this awareness of ourselves, we can look back, and it takes a little bit of the sting out, because you're able to say, ah, that's where, you know, this part is really important to me, and that's where it broke. And I, I have, this has happened in my own life, and I can look mm -hmm. back on projects that I had at DTS and say, oh, it's because I didn't get a chance to do it in a, in a really special, unique manner, which is really important for my mm -hmm. giftedness. And, and again, it doesn't make it go away, but it takes some of the pain out. So um, in our conversations, um, I've heard you talk a lot about the grace of God. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk a lot about the sovereignty of God, that we can actually relax and understand that he has created me as I am. I need to just live this out as I go and serve others. Um, and the posture is always outward. So um, how can we, I guess, be more gracious towards others, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's where it's for the in, in the, in the church, all of this is for the building up of the body. It's not for me, it's for others. Mm -hmm. So um, how then, how does the, hmm, where does this land? The giftedness discovery, there's that. I guess what I'm asking, what do I do now? How about that? What can mm -hmm. I do now? I can watch for that and we could do that because that's real helpful. What do I do now? Yeah, so God's grace flows into us through those ways of helping us with success and failure. But the key to giftedness is actually that it is not about you. Mm. It was given to you to serve. And, and we can serve more intentionally once we go through some of these exercises and these processes and it gives us some language and that kind of thing. But again, you have your giftedness baked into you exactly as you are now. So when you choose to just go and serve, you are already serving in your giftedness. Mm -hmm. You can do it more intentionally after a workshop or something like that, but that shouldn't even keep you from going and serving now That's because good. you have something to offer, very uniquely something to offer that nobody else does. And so it would be a tragedy, especially like in the church, yeah. in our church, if we are not benefiting from not only how God created you, but that he was gracious enough to give you to us. Wow. So the question is, um, where are you serving? How are you serving the mm -hmm. Lord? How are you building up the body? That should be the, 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 um, the answer that each of us seek, right? I want to um, I wanna close by sharing this story, it, and it just happened yesterday. Uh, we were able to celebrate, honor um, Barbara Stone, Sweet Life. She's been a member here for a long time. And I was talking to Irv, uh, her husband. They've been married almost 70 years. And um, Irv is 93 years old. And so I was just trying to encourage him and tell him, you know, the Lord's not finished with you. And, and he's got plans for you. And he gets this smile on his face. And he says, well, you know, here's what I'm doing. Uh, where I live, uh, this assisted living uh, place, I, I am, uh, I've got, I, I'm gonna start a prayer gathering because I think everybody could pray, right? Like everybody, that's not a big deal. We can all come together and we all need prayer. He said, I tried a Bible study, but that didn't go so well. So I'm gonna now do a prayer gathering and we're gonna come together and pray for each other. And I said, hey, and you know what? You could be like offer a devotional word, you know, from God's word, because he's a teacher, still teaches here. And, and so my point is this, to have that mindset, regardless of whether you're 13 or 93, every person is gifted by God. And, and I saw him light up because when we serve the Lord and we know that's why we're here, then we all can experience the joy of being who he's created and designed us to be. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just a beautiful story um, as we celebrated Barbara's life yesterday and that you're never too young, you're never too old. Every person has a place here, right? Absolutely. So Kim, we can't wait for Wednesday night. I want to hear more about your dissertation, but we'll dive deeper into why it's important to, to get uh, a real focus on how we're gifted. So again, come back and join us, but let's thank Kim for being with us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, before we wrap up our time together, I want to offer this word. Um, Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, we were in, he goes on to, to chapter 13. And that's where he says, what you might know, he says, you can do all these things. You can have all kinds of gifts. 
And you can do all these great things, but if you don't do it out of love, then you're just noise, just a clanging symbol, right? So at the heart of it all is the love of God, not even our love for him, but his love for us. As we serve him, Jesus said, the way that you serve and follow me is you love God by loving others. Again, that's the cruciform life. That's the life of a disciple. So everything we do is out of love, but it's because of his great love for us. And and Jesus has shown us his love for us ultimately by not only living the perfect life, he served others out of his giftedness, right? Better than anyone. And he did it for us as a substitute. He lived the perfect life. He did this perfectly or we will struggle. He did it perfectly. And not only that, he went to the cross. He died on the cross for our sin because we all need rescue. And he's the one who then invites us into his family and into the church to serve one another so that we become this place where people people step in and say, my, how they love each other. And the watching world sees us loving each other in community and always for the building up of the kingdom outside of this place. And so I'm gonna close in prayer and uh, we'll hand it over to our crew in the, in the chapel and we'll close our time here. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you for the reminder today that we have been created for your purposes. And Lord, I, I thank you for Kim. I thank you for Travis and their family. We praise you for the gifts that they bring to our our body. And we pray, Lord, that each of us now will do the hard work forward to determine what our gifting is and what our place is, how we can serve you best here in your church. And so we thank you for the opportunity. Now we go forth to serve you with our lives, even today. In Christ's name, amen.